Welcome to the One to Know podcast, hosted by Inside Texas Joe Cook and 104.9 The Horns' Brad Kellner. The One to Know podcast is part of the Everyone Gets a Trophy podcast channel, and today we will discuss the Texas Longhorns' uh, Texas baseball regular season, their recent postseason successes, and the upcoming Super Regional matchup versus South Florida. We'll also talk a little bit about Texas hosting some recruits for their upcoming junior day, including one of the top quarterbacks in the country, making his way to Austin. Listen to both our show and the Everyone Gets a Trophy podcast hosted by Kevin Dunn and Paul Wadlington. Subscribe to our channel wherever you get your podcasts and leave a review to let us know what you'd like to hear us talk about. And of course, the show would not be possible without the following sponsors. Audio-visual consultations. Give them a call at 255-8678. That's 512-255-8678 to get the home TV setup of your dreams. Hopefully... You've already called AV Consultations. You can watch the Super Regionals and the College World Series on your custom TV setup. But if you haven't, it's not too late. Give them a shout, 512-255-8678. And the One to Know podcast is also brought to you by Altstadt Brewery. Altstadt Beer, it is German beer made here and the best beer that you can find in Central Texas. So whatever you have going on this weekend and all summer long, Make sure you accompany your good times with Altstadt beer. No impurities, no regrets. Brad, like like Texas, um, I'm back. Yeah, welcome back, Joe. I'm back. Good I've, to see I've, you, man. I've seen you out and about a few times, and uh, it hadn't been the same as sitting in studio over here at the Horn. So glad to do it. I know I had a few friends wondering when we were going to be able to <laughs> do this again because we all know that good audio quality makes a podcast, and hopefully we're about to bring that back. So it's good to be back. It's this good this to have does you help back, man. being face to face, and so I can. D- disagree with you vehemently in person Thank instead you. of just over the phone. I appreciate that. Yeah, I'm sorry you have to look at my face, right? That's one of the benefits of you getting to work over the phone is that you don't have to look at me. But uh, good to have you back. The quality of this podcast will increase. Not that it was ever down, but obviously with studio quality from both of us should make this thing sound better. And uh, it's good to see you, man. You yeah. didn't get lost on your way here or anything I, like that? I still remember how to get here. So luckily, and then, and this is the first time I had to get here from you know, place I'm, I moved in between seeing yeah. you last year and here, so it's good to finally be here. I think Google helped me out on that. Yeah, it always does. It always does. Well, excited to have you back and excited for what's coming this weekend for Texas baseball. Jim. Yeah, exactly. Texas is hosting a super regional again, the number two overall seed in the NCAA tournament. The path to Omaha is getting pretty, pretty uh, advantageous for Texas. They go ahead and get a I don't want to say a weak regional, but there were definitely stronger regionals uh, of the 16 selected. Made their way through Southern, made their way through uh, Fairfield, made their way through Arizona State. And uh, that can't be said for every other team in the NCAA tournament, every other host, because Florida just just laid an egg in Gainesville. Mm-hmm. I don't know how much Gator eggs are going for, but if you're looking for <laughs> one, Kevin O'Sullivan uh, did it big time this past weekend and... Uh, that means the only four seed remaining in the round of 16 is making its way to Austin in the South Florida Bulls in a little Charlie Strong reminiscent yeah. uh, matchup of uh, these two athletic programs. Two athletic. We won't see any horns down this no. weekend. That'll be a little bit of a shock, but uh, this should be another great weekend. 100% dish sold out in, I think, less than 12 hours. It's going to be crazy up there. Charlie Strong is not coaching the South Florida baseball team, correct? Uh, I don't think so okay. because I don't think they'd be here if that were the case. You know, well, he's God. he's too he's too busy uh, helping Chris Jericho out in wrestling <laughs> yeah, shows. Yeah, about that. That was uh, quite a scene in Jacksonville a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, what a gift for Texas. Let's be honest. I mean, a, a fairly winnable regional, and the Longhorns took care of business. You got to give Texas credit too. You can only beat the teams on your schedule, and Texas not only beat the three teams that made their way to Austin. They dominated the three teams that made their way to Austin, outscoring those three teams 33-5. to No game was ever in doubt. No game was ever in jeopardy. And, Joe, after a little bit of a struggle in the Big 12 tournament, Texas went 2-2, two and two, so it's not like they got completely trounced. But the offense failed to get things going up in Oklahoma City. So maybe there was some concern, like, all right, is this offense ready for the postseason? Is something going on with the bats in this lineup? Well, they scored double-digit runs in all three games in the regional, and it feels like that lineup is deep and strong, one through nine. But you're absolutely right. To get a South Florida team that needed to win its conference tournament championship to even make the field, that's an absolute gift for Texas, and the Longhorns should be able to take care of business this weekend. And it's funny. I don't know if this is that funny, actually, but uh, 
the football parallel. Texas was supposed to play South Florida in football in 2020 due to COVID, the reduced schedule. That didn't happen. Now the Longhorns will get to see the Bulls in baseball. Yeah, you brought up a point about the Big 12 tournament. Uh, Last time they played in the Big 12 tournament, because remember, they missed it in 2019, uh, didn't have it in 2020. Uh, In 2018, they went two and out. And then, you know, we saw what they did on their way, Cody Clemens leading the way. But in this past one, the big concern was, A, strikeouts. And I think the face of that strikeout issue was was Ivan Melendez. I think he played in three of the four games. I think he was sick ahead of that uh, very last one and, of course, struggling. So David Pierce held him out. Uh, But nine strikeouts in three games, three apiece. It was good to see him come back in the regional and send one well over the fence with ease again and kind of start looking like the Ivan Melendez we knew. And, of course, Zach Zubia, uh, most outstanding player, I believe, of that Austin regional, just hit. You know, he he is – he may not have the aggressiveness at the plate that you're looking for from a three-hole hitter, but he's got just – he makes up for that with how patient he actually is. You don't see that from guys that big who can work counts like he does and get good pitches to hit. He's such a smart player, too. I mean, he's gotten better every year with his game, but also the mental side of his game has improved every single year that he's been here in Austin. And I don't mind the patience at, at, at the plate. I know it's cost him at times, but he's a guy who likes to wait for his pitch, and I like that. Not the fastest dude on the team. Hell, he might be the slowest dude on the team, but he's one of the better base runners on the team, and he's become a great defensive first baseman too. So, yeah, he gives you a little bit of everything. Also leadership, which mm-hmm. you can't coach that. Zubia, a guy taking advantage of the COVID eligibility, staying here for a fifth year. Great to have him on this team. And, yeah, he played really, really well. Are there any negative takeaways we have from the Austin Regional? I mean, the pitchers all look good, right? How good was Tristan Stevens? I know he was playing against Southern and if the NCAA Tournament Committee got it right, Southern would have been the second-worst team in the field, right? Because Texas was the number 2 overall seed. But he was working quick. He was throwing strikes. He was efficient. Then Ty Madden did his thing. Then Pete Hansen did his thing. I mean, David Pierce probably didn't need to use the bullpen at all. Like, he was just <laughs> throwing guys in there because Texas was up by 8, 9, 10 runs. And he's like, well, i got to give these dudes some work. But... Any negative takeaways from that Austin Regional? It's really hard to find any. Yeah, exactly. I I, I think I asked him uh, at one point after one of the games, uh, or maybe after the weekend, if there was, you know, what what do you nitpick? And I think he struggled. Uh, there there were some some struggles with the middle infield defense, out of character from Mitchell Daly and and Trey Faltini, a few errors, but that's you know that's out of character. We've seen Trey Faltini and and. and uh, Oh my Mitchell gosh. Daly. Mitchell Daly. There we go. We've seen them make most of the plays all year. So that's not so much of a concern. And I think the point you made about the pitching, they didn't tax the pitching. Mm-hmm. Not not in the slightest. I mean, Aaron Nixon, they had to bring him in in a you know a non close game, quadzilla, as David Pierce refers to him <laughs> as. You know, they basically got everybody the work they needed to. Uh, they even was a, they were able to save some people. Nobody was really taxed, and all everybody who pitched, starters included. Got really big confidence-inducing album or not albums uh, outings, <laughs> including Pete Hansen, who I think I like his. I, I think Ty Madden is very in your face when he's on the mound, and I think that's what you want from a guy who throws a hundred. But there's something interesting about Pete Hansen's attitude. You know, throwing eighty-nine, throwing ninety, not overpowering you, but still making you whiff, and then walking off the mound, arms raised and in victory. That's that was a great sight to see, One of the, the, the a great way to, to cap the weekend. For yeah, Texas. I'm totally grasping for straws here, but one potential negative from last weekend's dominance for Texas, they didn't play any close games. Like, it's nice as a fan to not have to deal with stress, and I'm sure David Pierce prefers not to have to deal with stress, but it's hard to coach that, right? And Texas had some close games during the regular season. They had some important games during the regular season. You think of the series finale against TCU. Uh, you think of, what, the final weekend uh, of the season against West Virginia where they had to take care of business to win the Big 12. But it's different in the postseason. So Texas hasn't had to deal with that yet. And honestly, on paper, Texas shouldn't have to deal with that this weekend right. against South Florida. Like, Texas can easily win these two games, and they can kind of win these two games handily. So that might not see that might not be, and I almost hope it's not something the Longhorns deal with until they get to Omaha. But I guess if you want to really reach and say, hey, there's one thing we haven't seen from this team yet in the postseason, it's their ability to make key plays late in close games. Yeah, I, I, I get where you're coming from with that. But, I mean, you have to, uh, on the other side, look at Arkansas. Yeah. So Arkansas had Nebraska and NJIT, uh, a team who was, if you looked at their social media stuff, that's about as happy to be there as a team ever could be. <laughs> and they gave Arkansas a little scare. They did. But 
where Texas had to basically just you know cycle in guys because hey we need to get some work. Arkansas used their best pitcher, I think, for over like 150 pitches over the course of the weekend. Their best reliever, I think Kevin Copps is his name. So not everybody had it as easy. And I think if you would have, you know, your choice, would you rather go to game seven against the game Nebraska squad? Or would you rather cruise through three games? I think you picked the way the Longhorns went through. Yeah, no doubt about that. So what about South Florida? Texas and South Florida, best of three Super Regional starts Saturday. Late games, Saturday and Sunday, 8 o'clock first pitch on both nights. South Florida 31 and 28, but I'll give you the floor, Joe. You are inside Texas's baseball aficionado. What have you found out about South Florida, and what potential problems do they present for the Longhorns? So very similar to Southern, they don't make the NCAA tournament if they don't win their conference tournament. Uh, They won four or five games in the American uh, Conference Tournament. They entered it, doing the math real quick, I think they were... Uh, they were under 500 mm. entering the conference tournament. They go ahead and win that, probably steal a bid from, I guess if you had to say, Baylor. I think they were the last team in, uh, at least they, they or last team out. They definitely stole a bid because there was no way they were making the tournament. Uh, but like what happens with a lot of teams at this point of the year, like what Texas faced in you know 2018, they're hitting a team when they're hot. Uh, you know, you, you don't make it this far without playing some good ball over the past couple weeks, and that's what South Florida has done. Uh, they took care of Florida. They took care of the U. Uh, and then they had to get into a little bit of a dogfight with South Alabama but ended up winning that one. So, uh, you know, just on the surface, you have to recognize that they're a team that's playing their best ball at the best time of the year for them. But, you know, basically with all these teams, Texas is going to have way more depth than all of them. Yeah. They're, you know, when, when you look at Texas' bullpen – it probably goes Tanner Witt, Cole Quintanilla, uh, Aaron Nixon, and then if you really wanted to go down one more, you can go Lucas Gordon, maybe Palmer Wenzel. So that's a lot of arms right there. Uh, looking at the you know Bulls pitching staff, they have three good starters, and they may mix and match these guys to, to get two of them into a game because they're their best pitcher. Colin Sullivan has a 1.28 whip. Jack Jasiak, 101 whip. Dylan Burns, 137 whip. Their starters have been pretty good, and they have two solid bullpen arms. Uh, and over the course of a three-game series, that's something manageable. It's a little bit more manageable than a regional. Uh, but if they're able to touch up the starters, uh, if they're able to get a lead at all, it's going to be tough for South Florida mm-hmm. to come back just from looking at Texas pitching and just knowing that basically outside of a few guys for South Florida, they don't have the horses to run with Texas. This is a total mindset series for Texas. If they come in this weekend with the same mindset they had last weekend, they're going to be fine. And something that really impressed me with the way the Horns played in the regional, even after the three games were in hand, Texas still played well. They Mm -hmm. didn't take their foot off the gas. They didn't start making a bunch of errors or start walking a bunch of hitters. Like They kept their foot on the gas and really stepped on the throats of all three opponents. They didn't get lackadaisical with the way they played, even though, once again, the games were in hand relatively early on. If they keep that same mindset against South Florida, they should be fine. But I heard David Pierce on with Bucky and Aaron this morning on the horn, and he mentioned it, and I agree. Look, South Florida's pitching probably better than any of the three pitching staffs that Texas faced last weekend. I know coming in, Fairfield had the what, best ERA or second best ERA in the country? Against the MAC. Against the MAC. I mean, the level of competition was god-awful. So South Florida being in the AC, a little bit better. They played some good teams in the non-con. Like, their pitching is solid. And what David Pierce said that I agree with, South Florida's not going to give you free passes. Mm-hmm. Right? Texas benefited from the base on balls in all three games last weekend. I don't think that's going to happen as much against South Florida. So the Texas Bats are going to have to be alive and ready to go because I don't think they're going to be gifted those free passes like they were last weekend in the Austin Regional. But yeah, not a lot about South Florida's offense scares me, but they've got pitchers who are capable of maybe hanging with Texas for a while. But I agree with you. If you get to their bullpen early in any of these games— then you're in a real, real good spot if you're Texas. Yeah, Texas has to be wary of the strikeouts because all three of those main pitchers that I mentioned have over 80 strikeouts this year. And a few, and like I mentioned, a couple of those guys have made uh, bullpen appearances. Probably a lot of them came towards the postseason. Uh, but all of them have over 80 strikeouts. And, you know, even Jassiak, 210 opponent batting average, that's pretty respectable. Yeah. So there's some good pitching in there. Uh, Logan Lyle, one of their closers or bullpen guys, 186 opponent bat- batting average. Uh, in in 42 and a third innings has 45 strikeouts, so they can they can throw it by you pretty well. But if if they're able to cause some trouble on the base pass, 
get these guys done, get that pitch count up. It should be something Texas can handle. And then, you know, on the South Florida offensive end, uh, they have a couple good hitters. They have a guy named Carmine Lane. Carmine. Uh, Carmine. Carmine. I think it's Carmine. Did you ever uh, go to a place called Carmine's Pizza? Was that only a Dallas thing? I think so, because okay. I haven't heard of it. I'm not sure if it's an Austin thing, too. Maybe I haven't been since high school. I saw that name, and I was like, I wonder if that guy's named after the uh, slightly after the above pizza average joint? pizza joint in Dallas. It'd be like you naming your kid CeCe? Yeah. Well... Maybe. I don't think my kid's going to be good enough to be named after CeCe's. He's not going to deserve that name. Uh, but these two guys, uh, first baseman and third baseman, uh, both were hitting right around 300. Both had uh, on-base percentages you know, above uh, 360. Uh, Ho- Riley Hogan, the other one, had one at 392. Uh, they drove in runs, and they hit home runs this year. So I think those are the two guys that you really have to look out for. Nobody else in that lineup really seems like much of a threat. Uh, the only other name, if you need to, to go by the rule of threes, is Matt Ruiz. He wasn't great, uh, but he could steal bases. Eight of twelve. That's that's really, and that's not even a ton, you know. No, either. they don't play a lot of small ball. They're not aggressive on the base pass. They don't try to swipe bags. They don't bunt almost ever. So they are a swing away type of team, and you could tell looking at their base running numbers, and honestly, their their batting averages too. They like to hit, and they like to hit for power. Right. So you can really trust Silas Arduan this this week to uh, make sure that they keep everything in front of them. And then, you know, it kind of sounds redundant, and kind of sounds what we've been saying over and over again. But just play the game that you've been playing all year. You know, you got to be the number two team in the country for a reason. No time to let off the gas, and it's time for this team to make it to uh, up to Nebraska for the 37th time. That'd be awesome. I'm a big fan of the transitive property, Joe. I'm not sure why. It's just like the only property I remember from those math properties <clears throat> we were taught 15 years ago, and really the only math thing I remember at all from all the math classes I took growing up. But uh, common opponents, South Florida and Texas. South Florida did play against Texas Tech, a series in Lubbock at the end of March. Uh, the Bulls were swept by Texas Tech. Two blowouts. The series finale was a 7-4 to win for Tech in Lubbock. Of course, UT played Texas Tech in Big 12 play. The Longhorns only won one of the three games against the Red Raiders here in Austin. Texas Tech still playing. And then the other common opponent for these two teams, Houston, who of course is in the AC with South Florida. Texas played Houston in the non-con early in the season. The Longhorns took two of three down in H-Town. Meanwhile, South Florida split a four-game series with the Cougars. So there you go. If that means anything to you, there's your common opponents. And also, in terms of other quality competition, because there's no doubt the Big 12 is better than the American Athletic Conference, South Florida did split a four-game series against East Carolina. East Carolina's still in. Good team. They were, I think, the number 13 national seed. They're playing Vanderbilt this weekend in the Super Regional. So against decent competition, South Florida was able to do some things But uh, once again, Texas is the better team. They're a more talented team. They are more battle-tested than South Florida is. But South Florida isn't like Fairfield to where they haven't played anybody. And their stats are super inflated because their conference sucks so bad. No, South Florida has played some quality competition both in conference and in the non-con. Yeah, I saw I think the the Seminoles were on their schedule. I think they they get around to Florida teams. And like like we said, they they played Florida and Miami in that regional and got passed. So uh, in – they're, if you're here, you're here for a reason, but this is a game Texas should should take care of business And with. Texas, 30-5 and five at home. They've been dominant at the dish all season it's long. It's going to be packed. It's going to be a, a sight to see. Because I, I had a wedding on Saturday, this past Saturday. I think that was the Arizona State mm-hmm. game. And so, you know, an 8 p.m. Sunday crowd kind of limits your excitement and, and energy. Uh, that 8 p.m. Saturday crowd is going to be rowdy. You're going and this weekend? I am really excited to be there. I think I'm going to go, too. I'm very nervous. I've been to two games this year, once inside the stadium and once out in left field with the Occupy left field guys. The game I went to inside the dish, they won. It was the series finale against Texas Tech, but the game I went to in left field, they lost. It was uh, the first game against West Virginia, mm-hmm. that final regular season series of the year. I'm very superstitious Mm -hmm. when it comes to all sports, but especially baseball and especially Texas baseball. What do I do here? Do I need to be scared about going to a game this weekend? Because the last time I was at the dish, they lost, and that was a very important game. Once again, uh, ultimately cost Texas the outright Big 12 championship. They, of course, split the conference title with TCU. But uh, do I need to stay home this weekend? Like I've got an opportunity to get out there and be a part of this atmosphere 
what say you? I don't want to be blamed, so I'm putting the think, onus on you to uh, make the decision for I mean, me. And I think the answer is obvious. If you go, you got to get in there. Can't be hanging outside the fence uh, this weekend because yeah. we saw what happened last time you did that. And so so what, what if I do both? Like, what if I go early and right. drink with the guys in left field, but right. then utilize my ticket and go sit inside? You're good. Is that that's, fair game? That's the way to do it. Okay, I think that might be the move. Yeah, I mean, the atmosphere last weekend, I didn't go, but uh, just on TV, uh, you could hear how electric it was. And I heard David Pierce once again on with Bucky and Aaron on the horn today. This is Thursday when we're recording this. He said, he thought that was the most electric he had ever heard the dish, like even louder than the Super Regional against Tennessee Tech back mm-hmm. in 2018. So that was for a regional, Joe. Mm-hmm. For a Super Regional this weekend and another spot in Omaha on the line, this place is going to be absolutely insane. And, yeah, you'll take the night game. It's a little cooler, which makes the fan experience better, but more time to get lubed up, man. Right, exactly. More time to drink, more time to get amped up. The crowd is going to be full, but also uh, loud as all hell. So, I'm excited, man. This team deserves it. They, they've they been great all year. They've been great at home all year. But, of course, until the last couple of weeks, they've had to play in front of a uh, smaller crowd. They deserve this big crowd. And my guess is South Florida has not seen a crowd like this all year, anything close to a crowd like this all year. So hopefully uh, the folks at the Dish can, can make a difference this weekend. Before we kind of get into an overview, just kind of reflecting on the, the whole of the 2021 season, any of the uh, other Super Regional matchups catch your eye? Mm, I well, think I think the one I'm looking at that's that's real interesting is going to be LSU and Tennessee. Yeah, a lot of storylines there. Tommy Vitello at Tennessee, uh, helping the Vols to what number three overall seed in the country. Uh, Paul Maneri at LSU wasn't he on the hot seat like three weeks ago? Well, he's he's going to retire, so okay. he's he's staving off retirement. He he and his Tigers played Oregon in a classic yes. game seven uh, up in Eugene. One on a uh, go ahead balk, uh, which is just one of those things that y- you got to teach your team and hope that their training comes through. And uh, LSU squared around the bunt, first baseman charged, pitcher still threw to the first baseman, and you can't throw to an unoccupied mm. bag. So uh, LSU grabbed a run there, just a classic of a game. That's the one I'm really watching because Tennessee is going to be rowdy. And also LSU, A, they want to keep Paul Maneri's career going, want to get him one more trip to Omaha for the Tigers. But also, they thought, I, I think there may be a little bit of bad blood between those teams. Of course, it's an in-conference matchup, uh-huh. but uh, I'm real interested to see what happens there in Knoxville. And I guess if I had to throw one more at you, it's going to be Notre Dame and Mississippi yep. State. Uh, Notre Dame's been fielding and pitching really well this year, did extremely well in the ACC, and probably thought that they should have been a top-eight seed. I thought they definitely should have been a top eight seed. I like the Big Twelve. I'm a uh, I'm not a you know Big Twelve chanter, uh, but at the same time, you know, I'd like to see good things happen. I didn't think the Big Twelve was a three national seed team league this year. I thought that Tech would be on the outside looking in, and uh, apparently they did not. And what was even more surprising was that they believe that uh, Mississippi State was ahead of them as well, and I wasn't sure about that. So Notre Dame should have a chip on its shoulder, but uh, and talking to a few friends I know over at Irish Sports Daily, uh, there's uh, the uh, Duty Noble is a lot different than Fraycac Stadium. <laughs> it's going to be probably ten times the crowd that they are used to there in Starkville, and uh, that should be interesting to see if Notre Dame can handle that type of atmosphere and if Link Jarrett can uh, bring them up to Omaha. I think that is the best Super Regional matchup, and it's very important for Texas fans to keep an eye on that Super Regional matchup because if the Longhorns take care of business, well, their first game in Omaha will be against the winner Mm -hmm. of Notre Dame and Mississippi State. So I think a lot of Texas fans will be tuned in to that one. And yeah, back to LSU-Tennessee. Uh, those two teams played in Knoxville during the regular season. Tennessee swept the Tigers, but all three games were close. And I'm looking at this quote right now. Apparently, Paul Maneri called the Tennessee crowd nasty. And there were some dust-ups between LSU players and Tennessee fans a couple of months ago when they played. So some bad blood, as you mentioned, potentially there. Uh, I'll give you one more. It's the series in Lubbock. Maybe yeah. you're right about Texas Tech not deserving a top eight seed, but it's an eight nine matchup. So on paper, this could be your most intriguing super regional. Texas Tech hosting Stanford. I like Tech in this one, but Stanford looked pretty damn good uh, in their regional last weekend. So that's a pretty uh, intriguing matchup right there. And we'll see, man. A chance for the Big Twelve to get a couple of teams in Omaha this year. And it feels like Tech has been. A relative mainstay Mm -hmm. in Omaha uh, over the last decade or so. They've got a good opportunity, a series at home, to to try to get there again. 
Yeah. It's going to be hot. Early oh, yeah. starts out there. Oh, Real yeah. Real early starts out there. Can I ask you this? Because I know we're going to do sort of a recap for Texas, but one more super regional take I want to get from you. David Pierce kind of hinted towards Ty Madden getting the ball in game one. You okay with that going yeah. back to the regular season type of rotation? And my second half of that question would be, look, Tristan Stevens has been awesome mm-hmm. all year long. You could argue Pete Hansen's been better as of late. And I know Tristan Stevens was damn near perfect against Southern last weekend, but heaven forbid Texas drops game one against South Florida and you're facing elimination against the Bulls on Sunday. Do you maybe go with Pete Hansen because he's been your better guy as of late, or do you stick with uh, what got you here, your dance with who brung you? I think you go with what got you here. Now, I do have a pretty warm take for you, and I think Tristan Stevens may have deserved Big 12 Pitcher of the Year over Ty Madden, uh, both obviously first-team all-conference guys. But I think at this point, you go with uh, uh, Ty to start it and, and get that game one on Friday, get throw your, your power arm, and then, you know, these guys are good. Like you mentioned, they've been pitching well all year. They've been pitching well of late. Go with Ty. Go ahead and get that out of the way. Uh, hopefully you come through with the win. And if not, then you got your two best guys, you know, the two guys who have been pitching best yeah. following up. And, you know, we talked about how USF doesn't have – pitching depth really outside of those top three guys and maybe a bullpen arm or two. You just have to flex that depth and hope that they uh, play the game they've been playing all year. I'm with you 100%. You go with Ty game one, and then you go with Tristan game two, and hopefully you don't need Pete Hansen, right? Or or if you do, maybe he can come out of the bullpen and get a couple of final outs for you uh, in game two to clinch a spot in Omaha. But, uh, yeah, I'm with you. Stick with uh, what got you here. Tristan Stevens. I'm with you. I mean, for a month plus, he was the best pitcher on this Texas staff, and he did have a case to be in that conversation for Big 12 Pitcher of the Year. So, man, it's nice. It's nice to have three guys that you feel great about. Not just good about, and it's not like, you know, you've got two guys you feel great about and the third guy's good, but like, okay, you know there's a pretty significant drop-off in between number two and number three. Uh, You feel good about any of these three guys going up against anybody in the country, and I know Vanderbilt has their two with Rocker and Leiter, uh, they don't have a third like Pete Hansen. No, so I don't know if there's their... any team in college baseball that has a one, two, three as good as Texas. That's been their Achilles heel, heel for mo- much of this year is that you go rocker, you go lighter, and then it's what do we do in game three? Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I, I'm I'm with you there. This should be a, a a lot of fun. And, man, looking outside a little bit, you know, it's in the mid-90s. It's humid. I mowed my lawn yesterday drenched in sweat. Are we and, in Houston uh, right now? What's going on here? It's a, it's a, Austin is a two-shower-a-day city right oh. now. So, uh, but – that does bring me back to kind of the overview in that, remember, what, four months ago? It wasn't 80 degrees. It wasn't 90 degrees. It was 9 degrees. <laughs> and Texas had to go to Arlington yep. to play Mississippi State, Arkansas, and Ole Miss. And they couldn't practice the week before. UT had closed for, obviously, the safety of all the students. Uh, and that meant that UT facilities were closed and Dish Falk Field and the J. Dan, Dan Brown Player Development Center are UT facilities. So they couldn't practice basically most of that week. They were probably concerned about you know their family, their own well-being, if their apartment's pipes had burst, all that different stuff. And then it's like, oh, hey, go to Arlington and play three of the top five teams <laughs> yep. in the country. And they got – they they got their ass kicked. I think they would tell you that. And I, you know, I wrote a story while about how they have basically carried the mantra "Remember Arlington" for all this year. And of course, once they got back in the swing of things, once they were back in practice, once they you know beat up on a decently a, a decent uh, non conference schedule, they played a good South Carolina team, but there wasn't a lot in the out of conference. U of H did not amount to much, and uh, you know some of their non con teams were pretty weak, but they built up over the course of this year, and they became a Texas team that's very reminiscent of a lot of Texas successful Texas teams of the past with one key difference, and it's that they can put the ball in the gap and they can put the ball over the fence. Mm-hmm. They field really well. Uh, we've mentioned the, the players up the middle with Faltini and uh, Daly. Uh, Cam Williams, occasional error, mm-hmm. but for the most part pretty solid defensively. He's not letting balls get by him. He's making throwing errors but he's not letting balls get by him. Uh, Zach Zubia, the big cat, like you said, has improved year over year. And then you got three pretty fast guys out in the outfield in Kennedy and Tico. Unfortunately, no Austin Todd. But Yeah, could you got, imagine how good this team would be if they had that dude? Got to credit uh, Douglas Hodo III for what he's done this year. A reliable defensive catcher. 
and Silas Ardwan, who can do pretty well with handling the running game. Uh, this looks like a Texas team yet, you know, reminds you of a lot of those teams just trade out some gap to gap power, just trade out the old small ball with some gap to gap power. And this, this is what Texas baseball is supposed to look like. Pitching and defense, right? When you think of the best teams in Texas history, you think pitching and defense, and this team has both of those. And I agree with you. There's no easy out in this lineup right now. And most of the lineup has gap to gap power. Most of the lineup has deep ball power, but just about everybody is a threat for an extra base hit in this lineup. So they do everything right, Joe. I mean, there's no glaring weakness on this baseball team. And I'm not sure there has been a glaring weakness for the last month or two. You can nitpick some things, and right. it sounds like you've got, got something. One nitpick. But in terms of just the overall components, the five tools of baseball, it feels like Texas does a pretty damn good job of everything. But I'm curious what's on your mind. I'm really curious how David Pierce handles left field because Eric Kennedy, he struggles against left-handed pitching. And he struggled towards the end of the regular season over the past few weeks in both the regional and a little bit during the uh, Big 12 tournament, he put some hard hits on on the ball. Uh, doesn't have much to show for it. So I'm really curious if, A, David Pierce trusts Eric Kennedy for, to go against any left-handed uh, pitching. And if, if he doesn't, I'm curious how Dylan Campbell might hold up in that regard. Because Dylan Campbell is a guy, I think he was an infielder by trade coming out of uh, straight Jesuit in Houston. And he's become a guy who they made kind of learn left field, and he's picked it up a little bit, picked it up well. And he, if you remember in that game one versus Southern, uh, that Southern threw a left-hander, Dylan Campbell got the start, I believe. And once yes. Texas knocked that guy out, then Eric Kennedy made his appearance. The other thing, this isn't a nitpick, but something I'm curious to, to know about is if, you know, where's Murphy Staley going to get his at-bats? Because he's a guy that David Pierce has wanted to bring along all year, uh, it's just it's just hard to find a place in this lineup for him to go through. Uh, but still, if that's your guy, that guy's starting at a lot of different programs yeah. right now. Uh, and if he's a guy that you can bring off the bench that you can maybe rely on for a pinch hit for some reason, that's not a bad option to have. But that one nitpick, that one question is, you know, what's maybe that strategy with playing uh, in left field? as the season goes on. And it's funny, like that is such a first world problem that Texas has because we're talking about the number nine hitter in the lineup. And like, uh, he's good, but like he's got this little weakness against lefties and uh, do we switch him out? Like that's such a luxury for Texas to have because there are some guys who have that with their number five or number six holes in their lineup. But I'm with you. Yeah, Eric Kennedy... He's taken some quality at bats, but the offense hasn't been there consistently for him, especially against left-handed pitching. So maybe you've uh, you've got a case there for that. But man, this team is deep. They've got some guys off the bench who can contribute, like you mentioned. The bullpen's been good. Maybe that was a question for a while, right? It took Aaron Nixon a little bit to get into the swing of things, but he's been great. Tanner Witt's been great. Keith Ania, you could argue, has been the best pitcher on this team this year. Uh, you've got uh, a lot to work with for Texas. So it's been a fun ride, man. And I hate to do this, like, I don't even want to talk about this because I'm worried it'll speak it into existence, and I don't want to get blamed for a disaster happening at the dish this weekend. This is a big series for David Pierce. Absolutely. Like, when you coach at Texas, you've got to make it to Omaha. And, hell, when you're at Texas, you have to do something in Omaha, right? Just getting there is not enough to be the head coach of this program. We're talking about a program that's had four coaches for a century, Mm -hmm. or had four until David Pierce sees the fifth. You can't lose this series. No. I, like, that wipes out winning the Big 12. That wipes out being the number 2 overall seed. That wipes out winning the Austin Regional in convincing fashion. If you don't ca- take care of business against South Florida, I think right now, Joe, everybody's pretty cool with David Pierce, but the Texas baseball diehards, there are some guys who still aren't thrilled that David Pierce is here and would have preferred some other options back five years ago when Texas had its last coaching search. If this team doesn't get it done this weekend— you're going to go from 0 to 100 real quick in terms of how people feel about David Pierce being the head baseball coach of this team moving forward. Yeah, this is a baseball school. Uh, the, the expectations are high, and as they should be. I'll, I'll, there's something I disagree with in that you can't totally toss out, at least in this case, because I know a lot of people may want to make the to argument about, like, well, Shaka Smart, won, he made the tournament, and he won the Big 12 tournament, and he lost to Abilene Christian. That's basketball. This is a different sport. Same athletic program, different sport, different expectations, higher expectations. It doesn't wipe out winning the Big 12. It doesn't wipe out being the best team in the conference over the course of a you know 60 game or however many game, 57 game regular season. But you are right in that 
this is a place where you're judged on postseason success. If you've made half of the College World Series, and if you still have continued to make College World Series even in the 64 team era, you know, that's the expectation. And last time, 2018, no one expected that team to get there. Right. No one thought that Texas should should would be a team. I, I mean, they, they won the Big 12 on a miraculous not a miraculous run, but just a s- scorching run. It's pretty miraculous. Right. Uh they kind of cobbled together a bullpen, uh, and they made it all the way to Omaha, and they were dealt out pretty quickly by mm-hmm. two quality teams. This is a team that is built not just to make it to Omaha, and this team also believes that too. They're not they, – they're, 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 anything I'm saying right now is something that I think a member of that team or David Pierce himself would be like, yeah, we're not just going to get there. We're going there – we're trying to go there to win it uh, and win more games. So uh, I, I, it's hard for me to – really be super down on David Pierce, even just going back to that hiring process, because he's the one that said yes. It's not his fault that the process got to him. Right. And I think at this point, five years later, with you know one incomplete and one F, and the rest, you know, I think that first year was B plus. I think 2018 was an A. If they make it here, I think it's an A with an ability to go to an A plus. Like he's been a very good baseball coach at Texas. It's just kind of interesting to see, you know, how how much one three game series decides things, but it's it's the way it works here. Yeah. You, the standards are that high to where it has to be that way. That's it. Whether it's fair or not, the conversations are going to pick up if mm-hmm. they can't get it done this weekend. And I'm not going to be calling for David Pierce's head. Let me say that right, right. now. Even if they lose in two games to South Florida, he should be brought back. I next don't think year. anybody who is going that route is grounded in the right place yeah well there's sports fans which is short for fanatics and uh you know sometimes we're overly passionate but uh yeah no that's that's just how it works at texas so hopefully once again uh, this conversation is for not texas can't take (laughs) care of business and not only make it to omaha but also do some things there but it's just i think important to bring up important to talk about because if it does happen once again people are going to be talking a little bit when your boss says that the expectation is to be a top 10 team you got to be a top 10 team yeah and uh, that there's one way to do that in baseball, and that's to guarantee a spot in the top eight. So, Should we go predictions here before we shift gears and talk a little football recruiting? Let's do it. What do you think? Good guys in two. Good guys in two. Yeah. I, it's just hard to go either way. I, you know, I found some college baseball. Uh, you know, some cousins sent me some numbers. There you go. But I couldn't find them for this upcoming weekend. Uh, let me see if they got it real quick. It's been a tough search, and, you know, the Cousins don't normally look at college baseball too, too often. Which but is a shame. They I, should look at it more. I wish we had more lines for college baseball. Sorry, my cousin wishes we had more lines for college baseball because uh, I think he could have made some decent money betting on Texas this year. Exactly. I can't find any on, on you know, my favorite cousins. But, mm. uh, it, you know, I, I, I feel like if, if you were putting a number to it, Texas, they're, they're, I bet their money line would be at the minus for this weekend. Yeah, I'd say a pretty hefty minus too, like uh, a minus four hundred something, something like, like that. a pretty hefty favorite. Look, Texas, it's the only four seed left. That's it. I mean, Texas is a bigger favorite in their super regional than any other favorite in any other super regional this year. I'm not looking at any lines that tell me that, but I can say that with 100 percent confidence that out of all the teams, including Arkansas, who's ranked number one, out of all the teams hosting a super this weekend, Texas is the biggest favorite, and they should be. They looked awesome last week, and they're playing a team that probably shouldn't be here. Right. They looked great last week, but uh, you know, they had a very average regular season. You mentioned it, they were sub five hundred going into their conference tournament. They are lucky to be here. Meanwhile, Texas has done everything right en route to hosting this super. So it's gonna be fun, man. I'm excited to uh I'm gonna make the claim now. I'm gonna be at the dish. I'm excited to be there. There we go. If they see if they lose the first game, then I can't go back Sunday. But if the if they win the first game, do I have to go back on Sunday? Is that how it works? Yeah, I don't want to get blamed. Like if they win the first game and I don't go Sunday or then Monday, then then I might get blamed for this team coming up short. I can't long, have that. As long as you don't have to produce B and E in the morning, you should be uh, all right with what you need to do on Sunday. Yeah, thank God those <laughs> days are behind me. Love those guys, but I do not miss the uh, four a.m. alarm. All right, what else do you want to hit? You want to go football here for a little bit? Let's go football. The dead period's over, ended about nine days ago. Kids are seeing campuses, and uh, I'm glad. I don't care if you're going – I don't care what high school you go to. I'm glad that you, the high school prospect who is listening to the 1-0 podcast, are making your way and seeing you know college campuses because the average student was able to do it uh, for the most part throughout everything. 
Uh, but the NCAA said that the average student athlete could not. And those days are over. The dead period is over. And Texas is hosting a lot of players. They hosted a bunch of uh, seniors to be last week, uh, first official visit weekend. But this upcoming weekend, while the uh, Super Regional is going on, they're going to have Junior Day. And they're probably the biggest name in the junior class, the class of 2023, is set to be in Austin this weekend. And it's not Texas commit Ruben Owens running back out of El Campo, who you're glad to see after a visit to LSU and I think to Alabama, made his way back to Austin not only earlier this week, but is coming back again. Arch Manning, Mm -hmm. the nephew of Eli and Peyton, the son of Cooper and the grandson of Archie Manning, 2023 from Isidore Newman in New Orleans, Louisiana. He's set to be here this weekend. And like I mentioned, that's probably – that's going to be the wildest recruitment in the 2023 class, the most paid attention to recruitment to cover with not only how much of a quality player he is, number one quarterback, probably you know top three, top two, maybe number one player in that class. And he's making his way to Austin, and a lot of it is because there's a lot of faith in what Steve Sarkeesian does on his offense. I think that's 99% of it, right? If Tom Herman were still the head coach at Texas, Arch Manning is not visiting Texas, at least in an official capacity, right? You only get five official visits this summer, and Texas is one of the five for Arch Manning that has everything to do with Steve Sarkeesian. I'm excited Arch Manning is coming here. I'm excited that Texas is in the mix, but we're a long ways away Mm -hmm. from Arch Manning putting pen to paper or putting words on a tweet and hitting the blue tweet button saying where he's going to play his college football. This weekend doesn't matter that much, Joe. What matters for Texas in their quest to land Arch Manning is how this offense looks the next two years. Mm -hmm. This year is important. But also next year is important, right? With Quinn Ewers, if there's any chance that Texas has to get Quinn Ewers to flip back from Ohio State to Texas, they're going to have to be awesome on offense this year. They're probably going to have to at least get to the Big 12 title game, if not win it, and the offense is going to have to look vastly improved over what we saw from Tom Herman. But the good news with Arch Manning is you have two years to do that. But Mm -hmm. let's be honest, Joe, the honeymoon period will wear off very quickly Right. for a quarterback as good as Arch Manning who can play anywhere in the country. And Clemson just had the number one overall pick in the NFL draft at quarterback. And they've got another five-star there. And Alabama's got first-round picks seemingly at quarterback every single year now. Like, there are other schools who have proven that they have the ability to develop those blue-chip guys into first-round picks, high first-round picks in the NFL. If Texas doesn't show improvement on offense and the winner of the Casey Thompson-Hudson card quarterback battle does not look good and, and this offense isn't doing things and Texas isn't competing for conference, if not national championships then this weekend doesn't matter. Arch Manning visiting Texas in June of the summer going into his junior year means absolutely nothing. So I'm glad he's here. Once yeah. again, I don't mean to diminish that. And hopefully he has a great time, and hopefully he leaves Austin feeling better about UT than he does right now. But let's be honest, uh, what matters here is what happens on the field this fall and next fall. Yeah, that's true. But you gotta you got to put your foot in the door in order to, to be able to open it. For and, sure. Uh, you know, like you mentioned, he was at Clemson this past weekend. Dabo is basically his shadow the whole time. Left with a Clemson offer. They are very peculiar about how they give that out, and uh, I'm surprised they didn't do it earlier, but he finally – he earned that offer. Good for Arch Manning, lowly Arch Manning. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, I mean, it, Steve Sarkeesian's offensive reputation, not just in the college circles, not just from his days at USC and the Raiders and, and – and, uh, well, there, I kind of spoiled it there. Not just at USC and Washington and Bama – but also in the NFL, probably with you know Matt Ryan and his reputation there, that's a big part of why they're coming. And also the the education factor of Texas, you know, and what appeals to most other recruits. And the other thing that they have going for them is remember Reuben Owens, he's met up with Arch Manning a couple mm-hmm. times before. Uh, John Tay Cook, a, a wide receiver from Desoto, one of the better wide receivers in this state, he's also been known to to talk with Arch a little bit. And they're all going to be here this weekend, getting to know the staff, getting to know everybody better. What's really interesting to me is like what schools are involved with Arch Manning because, you know, I think the first eight included all the schools you would expect, Alabama, uh, LSU being a New Orleans kid, Texas with Sark, uh, Tennessee because of Peyton, Duke because of uh, David Cutcliffe, I think Georgia may have been in there, Uh, not in there, and very surprising. Ole Miss just doesn't seem to be a factor. Hmm. And uh, with Archie and Eli, you'd think that maybe they would have a chance. But 
just doesn't seem like they they want to board the lane train for some mm. reason. So, uh, but you know, it it it's, it's a big weekend. There's also you know I know uh, uh, Arch is the headliner, but there's plenty of other guys. Jalen Hale from Longview, Ashton Cozart from Richland Hills, J- JV and Toviano from Arlington Martin. That'd be a good place to continue to build yeah. a pipeline with the guys that you've had come in from there. So this is a big weekend for Texas, and then of course. Going into the next couple of weeks, there's going to be more and more official visitors. But yeah, Arch is the headline. Uh, it's gonna there's it's gonna be a frenzy of a recruitment to cover, and uh, it's gonna be fun to see if that offense, like you mentioned, can make an impact on Arch's recruitment this so year. So this is the big junior weekend, right? And then yes. next weekend will be the big more official visit class of 2022 senior weekend. Correct. Man, I'm so glad official visits are back. We had, what, 15 months? Something like that. Without an official visitor here in Austin. And it's not just happening in Austin, right? All over the country, schools are allowed to have official visitors once again. But uh, it's great. And we saw, I guess it was the basketball team, and Keontae George, the five-star basketball recruit at the Dish last weekend. Chris Beard walking around. Chris Beard, yeah. Taking pictures, firing the cannon. I hope we see some Texas football recruits at the dish this weekend. I'm sure Sark and their coaching staff has a bunch of stuff planned at the football facilities, but uh, it would be pretty cool, and I think it would be a great taste for those kids to see what Texas fans are like if they could make it out to a baseball game this weekend. That would be awesome. And I guess it would have to be Saturday, right, because they'll be gone by Sunday night by the 8 o'clock first pitch. So hopefully Saturday uh, Sark and company take all of the recruits on visits to Austin to the dish because I know it's different. It's a little apples to oranges when it comes to baseball and football, but we're still talking about fruit here. We're still talking about Texas fans. So uh, that'd be a a good taste, uh, I think, for them and also a fun experience too, especially if Texas can take care of business in game one. Exactly. Hope they make it. It'd be exciting to see. No doubt. No doubt. All right. Anything else? We. uh... I got one small thing. One little promotion thing. Hit it. Inside Texas, if you've been uh, on the fence about joining in, we got a special promotion going on. You get three weeks free, and uh, now's the time to do it with all these official visits. You know, this weekend, next weekend, uh, last weekend in June. Uh, of course, team is working out, and uh, I, I cover the baseball team pretty closely. So uh, if you want to give it a try, go ahead and uh, go to Inside Texas. It's the first story on the front page, and uh, give us a look. I, I guarantee that you're you're going to like at least your three weeks, and hopefully you like it a little bit longer than that. Yeah, I can guarantee that too. I'm like the men men's warehouse guy. You're going to like the way you look. I guarantee it. Yeah, I'm looking at IT right now. Get 21 days of free premium access with Inside Texas's summer recruiting special. And then right next to that, you get Joe's South Florida Super Regional Preview. Obviously, we talked about that a lot, but if you want more content, if you prefer your content in written form, check it out, InsideTexas.com. That's probably a freebie too, Joe. Is that right? Mm-hmm. So you can uh, get in. But, yeah, you know, support IT, support the work that Joe does. The team at Inside Texas does phenomenal work day in and day out. All right, that's going to do it for this week's edition of the 1 and O podcast. Thank you all so much for listening. We really do appreciate the continued support. Thanks again to our sponsors, Audiovisual Consultations and Altstat Beer. Follow Joe on Twitter at josephcook89. Check out Inside Texas at InsideTexas.com. You can also follow them on all social medias at Inside Texas. And you can follow me on Twitter at Brad Kellner. And listen to the Triple Option with RBKD weekdays from 3 to 7 on the Horn and online at hornfm.com. We'll be back next week to recap the Super Regional here in Austin and hopefully talk about a Texas team that's on its way to Omaha. We'll talk about the official visit weekend in football. We'll preview next weekend as well and uh, plenty more Longhorn coverage coming your way. Make sure you check out the Everyone Gets a Trophy podcast as well. For Joe Cook, I am BK Brad Kellner. Thanks so much for listening. Until next time, y'all stay safe, y'all stay healthy, and hook them.